All right, good morning. Can everybody hear me? All right. So uh, thanks for the introduction. I am Chief Aaron McElroy. I go by Mac. Um, and since I started at AFPC in June, I feel like I've become extremely popular. I don't know if I got better looking or smarter, um, but I get a lot of emails from you and your teammates out there. And your AFPC is trying to take care of you, your teammates, and your mission every single day. Um, next slide, please. Sometimes I feel like AFPC is the misunderstood middle child a little bit. So uh, we're gonna try and explain really kind of how we're organized and who we are down at AFPC. We'll talk a little bit about some of the big rocks, some of the things that we're trying to work for you and your airmen, and then hopefully we save a little bit of time at the end to answer a few questions. I have 30 minutes this morning, which honestly I could probably brief you all day to go over all of the programs and functions of AFPC. Um, and so we're not gonna have time to get through all of that, but I will be around today. I'm happy to have sidebars, answer any additional questions, and kind of hear what's on your mind. Next slide. All right, so I don't know why, maybe I'm just like the slow chief, um, but it took me a long time to really figure out what AFPC's role is for the Air Force, how we kind of fit in. Um, as a youngster coming up, I thought, man, I wish I worked at AFPC because then I could do whatever I want, get to make my own rules, move people wherever. I'd have all my friends over in Hickam. We'd be living the life. Um, but really, we are the action arm for the A1 community, meaning down at the bottom of that inverted pyramid there, that's where you have headquarters Air Force, where the A1 community lives. That's who writes our policy. That's who comes up with our game plans. That's who really develops the strategy of where the HR portfolio is going. And then you see kind of that red line right above that, and that's where AFPC falls in. We are the action arm for all of those policies that are coming out of HAF and coming out of A1. Um, so we don't get to do whatever we want, um, but we do sometimes have some wiggle room to live in the gray. We do help shape some of that policy that is rolling out from HAF, um, and we're happy to do that. And really our end goal is to support the commander, support your airmen that are out there in the field and get you guys what you need. Next slide. All right, so this is kind of busy. Um, if you've never worked on a staff, if you've never worked up at the Pentagon, um, understanding how our, our organization is laid out is a little bit confusing. We call things uh, DP1, DP2, DP3, but really when you look at them, they're broken down into not necessarily functional areas, but how we execute the things up there. So our first directorate, DP0, if you really look at what they're doing, that's our IT and that's our innovation section that goes throughout AFPC. Now they serve all the different platforms that we have and we're gonna talk a little bit more about the digital transformation that we've been working on, um, but really they oversee all of those different platforms that support your airmen. We have our DP1, that's our customer service down at AFPC. If you've ever had to call the Total Force Service Center, you probably spoke to one of our contractors there and you probably thought, man, it doesn't seem like they know everything. Um, and you're probably right. Those are contractors, um, they have scripts. And so when you call in with a question, they go to their script and they look to see if the question that you're answer asking them um, kind of fits into their script that they have. If it doesn't, if it's kind of one of those exceptions, one of those one-offs, then they're probably gonna refer you to our next section, um, DP2, which is military operations. So military operations is really the art and science of AFPC. It's not only taking the policy and all of the directives that we have, but it's matching it up with, no kidding, what the mission needs and what your people need. That's where your assignment teams live. That's where things are actually getting processed. When you apply for retirement and maybe it's not falling within the exact parameters that we have set up, you need a waiver to your active duty service commitment our folks in DP2 are looking at that saying either they can improve it at their level or it needs to move on to our policy folks. Now their sister directorate is our civilian ops. Um, our civilian ops handles all the civilian hiring for the Air Force and the Space Force, all of the different HR programs that go into supporting our civilian airmen. Our policy directorate is our DP3. Um, we have business process owners for every single program that you can think of that really falls into the HR portfolio. Those are the folks that help shape some of that policy, that give recommendations up to half and say, here's what we're seeing from the field. Here's where we think we need to make some tweaks to this AFI. Here's the update. These will be the offices when you read through an AFI and it lists like 
contact this person as a POC. Those are our business process owners that live up in the policy section. These are also the folks that when your situation doesn't fall into a nice, neat bucket that meets all of the policy, these are the folks that will either approve or disapprove those exceptions to policy. Um, you see we have a DPF, we call this our care directorate, and all of the programs that you can think of that really get after airman resiliency, taking care of folks, things like casualty, things like our wounded warrior program, True North, all of the programs that are in our airmen and family readiness centers fall underneath our care division. And there's a couple additional ones up here that aren't listed. Like a typical wing would be set up. We do have a director of staff that does those normal functions for AFPC. But what they also do is all of the data analytics for um, the entire Air Force and Space Force. So when you're like, I wonder how many staff sergeants we have in the Air Force that have dependents when you're trying to work an issue for BAH or looking at how many of them are going overseas. This is the office that SimSAF uses when she's trying to put together a speech or try to put together talking points to talk to some of our elected leaders about getting after some of those airmen and family programs. Um, we also, in our director of staff, have the Air Force Survey Office. Throughout the years, you've probably received surveys, and at the bottom of it, it lists AFPC as the POC for it. We at AFPC do not necessarily care about all of those topics. We care, but really, um, we're getting after those on behalf of different stakeholders across the Air Force, but we're the execution arm for all of those different surveys that go out. One of our newer directorates that just recently stood up is our military pay directorate. If you haven't heard, um, military pay is gonna be transferring to the A1 portfolio. Um, so back in October timeframe, all of the DFAS employees out in Indiana that were currently working for DFAS, about 130 of them transferred over to the Air Force books and became part of AFPC. And down the road, you'll hear things like AFIPS, go claim your account. Um, that's so that all the military pay transactions can now become part of our HR portfolio. You might be wondering, well, why are we doing that? Um, it made sense to go to finance. Finance was the SME on pay. Well, because when you really think about those pay updates, when you get promoted, um, where does that get updated? gets updated in our HR systems. When you PCS and you go in process and your zip code gets updated and your BAH is calculated off of that zip code, where does that get updated? In our HR systems. So really, long term, the, the vision is that it's not gonna be this constant churn between having to go to numerous different places, having to go back and get things corrected because it wasn't updated in the finance system versus the HR system. All those things should happen automatically um, but instead of getting customer service from your finance folks, if you have military pay issues, you'll be showing up to your MPF and talking to those folks to try and get those things corrected. Next slide. All right, so this is just a really quick one. It's super busy. Here's the key takeaways in this. A lot of times I get these phone calls. Hey, Mac, um, I got an issue with one of my airmen's assignments. Who do I talk to? Well, I just showed you our org chart. That could be a lot of different places. There isn't one person I can tell you to talk to. Does the person require an exception to policy? Is this a simple thing where they just need their, author their orders authorized? Is it no kidding, they have an assignment loaded that we need to change for whatever reason? Um, and so what I would tell you is the first person I would start with is my FSS leadership. Um, if you don't know your MPF superintendent by first name at this point, if you haven't built that relationship, I'm telling you, this should be your new best friend. When you guys fly home on Saturday, I want you to hit the BX. They're gonna have all that clearance, Valentine's Day candy, get the big heart-shaped box of chocolates and uh, wander over to your MPF and say, hey, I'm, I'm Chief so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I just want to get to know you a little bit. I don't need anything from you, but I know when I do need something from you, uh, you're going to be the person I want to talk to. When we have changes coming, um, we are coordinating with your FSS leadership to try and make sure that they're prepped for your questions before it rolls out to the rest of the field. These folks, you can see all those different lines, they have direct comms over to AFPC. We're the the other red square up there over to the left. They know who to call, whereas you guys aren't always gonna know which directorate you need to plug directly into, they are. 
The other uh, untapped resource that I find a lot of times is your A1 MAGCOM staffs are gonna have a ton of information too. Um, a lot of times people wanna go direct to AFPC, but you have other resources along the way that I highly encourage you to tap into. If you have utilized those and you're still not getting what you need taken care of, then we're absolutely willing to engage directly with you guys. But a lot of times, there's a lot of time wasted because people aren't using their FSSs who truly are the experts and know exactly how to plug into us. Next slide. All right, so what's going on at AFPC? A lot. Um, like I said, we only have 30 minutes today. I wanna to try and save some time for questions. So I'm just gonna hit a few of the really big things. What are we focused on for 2022? Um, talent management. We heard a little bit about it yesterday. I think there was a question on talent marketplace. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that this morning. Uh, digital transformation, that is huge. You know, every job you move into, there's some unexpected things. I never thought when I went to AFPC as our command chief, I was gonna spend so much time in IT meetings. I am uh, old school. I've had an Apple phone for a very long time. I tried to switch to uh, another platform. Guess what, it didn't take, because I am not that IT SME. Um, my brain works in one direction only. Um, but this is something that I've, this is my 20% that I've actually had to work on and get a little bit better on. But we're gonna talk about uh, real broadly what's going on with our IT transformation and more importantly, why we need to make that transformation. Um, Today, um, we also are really focused on some of our partnerships. Nothing that really happens at AFPC is just an AFPC venture. We're always plugged in with our A1 teammates. Um, we plug in a lot with AETC, and there's a lot of partnerships there. Those are some of the three big things, but really today what I want to spend some time talking to you about is our EFMP central cell. Um, I will tell you up front that it has been a very nasty rollout. It has impacted a lot of our airmen who have been PCSing this last cycle. So I wanna talk through some of that with you and kind of tell you what our get well plan is with that and really, again, why we made this change. Sometimes when we change things, it's just like, man, why did we change this? This was so much better before. Um, but there really was some important reasons why we made this change to have a centralized cell. Next slide. All right, talent management. Some of you are probably in career fields. There's only a few of them, a couple of handfuls that are actually already in talent marketplace. Some of you aren't. Those of you who aren't are probably like, I don't even know what this platform is. I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. Um, for the career fields that are in it, um, our officers, our officer assignments have been in it for the last couple years. We've done beta tests for the last two years with a few career fields to really try and see if we can get the right person with the right skill sets into the right jobs at the right time in the right place. Um, they found a lot of success. That's two reasons. One, this platform brings us some new capabilities. And the other part is most of those AFSCs have also been executing their assignments under exceptions to policy for our no normal assignment rules. Um, it's really gonna take some changes to our assignment policies. SimSAF briefed you yesterday that there's been an enlisted assignments working group stood up and they've been coming up with different plans on how we change some of those policies to really get better at this business. Um, and the other part of it is having that IT capability to have the flexibility to get after some of this stuff. What I will tell you with Talent uh, Marketplace is to me, one of the most important key factors that it brings is the ability to communicate directly with your airmen. When we were coming up, um, unless you were on AMS on a regular basis, if you were at a location and you were motivated to get out of there, um, you were probably checking AMS every week, seeing what jobs got loaded, seeing what opportunities there were overseas, seeing what equal plus things were listed. Um, but if you weren't that person, you probably missed out on some pretty cool opportunities, or more importantly, the Air Force probably missed out on you because we weren't communicating directly with you saying, hey, we think you have the skills and abilities to go do this job, are you interested? So Talent Marketplace can email a group of people. So we pull the data, we say, hey, this is our list of folks that meet the requirements for this specialty job. We need them to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. We need them to have this particular background. It takes all that information, we load those names, and then an automated message gets sent out to that group saying, here's a cool opportunity. If you're interested, please log into the system and volunteer for it. That's huge. That in and of itself is a really big win. Um, 
starting probably, I would suspect in the next 30 to 45 days, you are gonna see some messaging coming out saying all enlisted equal plus is moving to talent marketplace. That's where you will also update your dream sheets or your base preferences. So basically all of the functions that typically are happening right now within AMS for enlisted are all gonna move to this platform. Um, that's gonna be huge. You know, I'm sure all of you can think of scenarios, you can think of positions within your own career field where it's really tough to find the right person to go in and feel there. There's probably times where ads have been run multiple times because we don't get the volunteers that we need with the right skill sets to go do some of these jobs. And so having the ability to communicate with the field and let them know, hey, this is who we're looking for. Please go in and opt in if you're interested is gonna be a big win for us down the road, um, some of the additional capabilities that we hope to see built out in it is instead of always going off of just, hey, this person has the most time on station, we should pick them, is the ability to really navigate with the hiring authorities and say, here are the 10 people that volunteered. Look at their records, determine if this person truly is the best fit for your organization based off of their background, based off of the different things that they've been doing. So. Um, we see some huge wins with it. It's been uh, a challenge working some of the budgeting, um, but we are getting there. We have uh, some pots of money that we think are gonna be available over the next couple of years to continue to build out this platform and have a lot of hope and optimism for really how we get after managing enlisted talent a lot better. Next slide. All right, digital transformation. So, I'm a very simple person. Um, I tend to do a lot of visualization in my head because I'm a visual person. So when I think about this particular problem set, um, I think of you know, safety. How many of you are safety monitors uh, coming up throughout the years? All right, at least a couple of us got stuck with that additional duty. Like the cardinal sin was you never daisy chain uh, the extension cords, right? <laughs> So that is what we have been doing with all 118 of our IT platforms and IT programs that support the HR community. We started with Mill PDS, that's kind of our, our main structure, that's our backbone for everything. And we, you know, over the years as we've determined different uh, platforms that we need, we said, hey, we're gonna create this database and we'll just plug it in with an extension cord. And we said, well, we need this. And so we built something else new. And we plugged that extension cord into the program that was already here. Um, and over the years, we've gotten 118 of these that are spread out all over the place. Now, some of them are written in different code because they're so old. And so we plugged them in here, but they no longer talk to the updates that we've done to this one. Um, how many times have you worked in systems where it's like, man, this information in this one is not the same as the information in this one because they're not, the systems are not talking to each other. The other thing we run into is that none of these are agile. If we wanna make a big significant change in the Air Force, uh, for example, this last year we said, hey, we're gonna calculate promotion points differently, right? We're gonna give folks that have some experience um, some additional promotion points if their performance is the same level as a person who's that first time tester. For us to make that happen, it wasn't um, a saying, hey, we don't think this is a good idea. We're, we thought that was an amazing idea. We knew we were gonna have some IT problems and we couldn't roll it out tomorrow. It was gonna take us six months to go into our current systems to actually make those updates, reprogram things so that when we it could roll it out, it actually worked. So being able to move to these agile platforms is gonna be huge. When we wanna make changes, we don't have to wait six months. We don't have to wait a year. We don't have to worry that this system supports, but this one doesn't. The other thing with our old systems is, you know, we went to the cloud a couple years ago, um, and what goes up must also be able to come back down. Well, these programs are so old that they went up, but they didn't come back down. And so a lot of that information just wasn't talking to each other um, and so really this is huge. We have to go there, but I will tell you that it's gonna be a little bit bumpy going there. Why? This stuff costs a lot of money. You guys heard yesterday, we don't have a lot of money. So a uh, quick story, my, base, my boss and I were out doing some base visits and there's this A1C, he's a PTL, and he's briefing us you know, on how awesome he is at his job and it's great. And this was right after we had launched one of our first programs on the My FSS platform. So my boss says, hey, great, you know, awesome, you're doing good stuff as a PTL. 
what do you think of uh, the new MyFitness website? And he's like, oh, general, it's awful. Um, my boss was kind of like, oh. You know, sometimes the generals don't really know what's actually going on at, at ground floor. Like, they're, they're focused on some bigger things. But he was not anticipating that particular feedback. And he said, well, is it better than the old AFIPS? And he's like, well, I don't know what AFIPS is. This, this airman was so young and so new, he had never had to work in AFIPS, um, which was fine. But really, from his perspective, we gave him an IT pl um, program that wasn't very good. Um, but what my boss had to go back and learn is, when we're launching this stuff, it is not fully built. All of our programs, when they are hitting the streets, are going to be min viable products, meaning they technically have the ability to do what the old system did, but they don't have all of the capabilities built into them that they will down the road. Now, why do we do that? One, um, and probably the most important reason, is we need to be able to shut off that old system. We are paying millions of dollars for these 118 programs. We need that money that we're paying the contractors to support these systems to spend and reinvest in developing out the rest of these platforms. So um, a lot of times when our airmen see these new programs, they just think they stink. They're not very good. You didn't give me any new capabilities. Please be patient. We will get there. They will be better than what they're currently using. But when they first hit the streets, they're not going to be perfect. Um, and if we understand that, if we understand we're doing that in a very intentional way, accepting some risk there, saying, hey, it's not going to be great, but it's going to be better down the road. We need to save some money with, by closing down these old ones and invest that in the development. Then I think it just gives us a different frame of reference versus saying, I don't understand why we switch. This isn't any better than what we are using. All right, next one, please. All right, EFMP. Um, I could probably talk to you for a couple hours on the stand-up of our central cell. I want to give you the why. Why did we, instead of having just at base level the med group to the gaining med group determine whether or not EFMP families could go to that gaining location? So back in 2019, a group did a study with our EFMP families, and we got a lot of feedback, and the feedback was EFMP sucks. If I am an EFMP family, I don't feel supported. There's a lot of uh, things that we need to be done differently. And a lot of it was really about the PCS process for these families. I receive an assignment. I got to go in every single time, fill out a book's worth of paperwork. I got to drag my whole family into the med group. We got to spend hours there, everyone being interviewed. Um, I got to go around to all the specialists that my family has seen, collect those medical records, bring them back, and then the special needs coordinator sends all this stuff off to my gaining base, and that gaining base comes back, and they still tell me no. And I go through this process every single time I get an assignment. And so our task was to stand up a central cell down at AFPC. Now, for most of us, we don't experience that. If you're not an EFMP family, you don't know what that churn looks like every single time you get an assignment. Um, but what we do know is if you're going overseas, you probably go through a similar process, but that doesn't happen with every single move. So when we set up the central cell, <clears throat> just purely looking at the assignment piece of it, we wanted to create, in the long run, a process where those families weren't doing quite so much work, and two, where it was a very fair process, where it was objective, where we could say, with all honesty, hey, we, we're looking from a global perspective what medical care is available for your family, and if you can actually go to that location, or if it's a situation where maybe that medical community just doesn't feel like that capacity is there for you, but we've looked a little bit deeper and we see that there is some specialist care available, um, and not necessarily have it be a situation where they're constantly being told no, they couldn't be supported. Um, an additional thing we built, and you'll see that small picture on the bottom there, that's part of the Family Vector website. That also gives those families an opportunity to look up whatever locations they're interested in volunteering for or whatever location that they've already received an assignment to and see if the specialty care for their family members has traditionally been supported there. So it's not necessarily a case where we have 20 years worth of data. We have about two years worth of data looking at if you know, seven out of seven times, if someone needed a cardiologist at Altus Air Force Base, those families were not approved to go there because that care was not available there. But 25 out of 25 times, if they were going to the DC area, 
cardiology was available. And it helps those families actually make some plans, decide what assignments that they're volunteering for, um, and have a better idea going into it. Next slide. So um, you guys probably remember from all your different PCSs, part of the initial little packet that MPF always wanted from you so you could get your orders was like six different things. And one of those things was the family member travel screening. It was a six question uh, screener and it was basically like, have your, has your family member received specialty care? Do you have anyone in special needs? This is not something new. This is something that has always been there for every assignment, regardless if you're going overseas, regardless if you're EFMP, everyone does this. The big difference is now it's gone online. And so when your airmen get an assignment, eight days after they get that assignment, they're gonna get an automated message saying go in and fill out this screener. If you answer yes, if you are an EFMP family or you're going overseas, that's when you're gonna go through the rest of this process to actually have the full medical clearance to see if you can be supported there. So I will tell you, I said, you know, when we rolled this out, we hit some significant, significant snags. One, the IT did not, um, it was not fully developed. Two, um, there were some unanticipated issues with the platform that we had no idea at the time were gonna necessarily go wrong with it. Um, and three, we weren't exactly sure if we had the manning correct to funnel all of these different cases through AFPC. Um, there's been a lot of lessons learned. We've made a lot of changes to the process. We are continuing to make changes to this process. One of the changes that we're making is for this next assignment cycle, members who are going overseas or who are EFMP will start receiving two-part orders. If any of you guys are in the PRP community, you're probably familiar with two-part orders, but the rest of the Air Force normally hasn't done that. So what does that do? Once you fill out your initial six-question screener, you go in and load your family's information to start that clearance process, you will get part one of your orders. Why is this important? If you don't have that, you can't schedule your TMO to be picked up, you can't request passports and visas. Those things take time. So this is gonna be a huge win for those families. But the important thing that I really need your help in communicating with your airmen is, without the second part, which happens once that full screening has happened and you've been approved to go to that assignment, that order is useless. They should not ship their household goods, even if they had TMO scheduled, um, they should not try to depart because without that second part of the orders that happens at the end of their clearance, none of that PCS is funded. This is gonna be a, a shift. This is gonna be something that we're gonna have to continually talk to the airmen about and make sure that they understand. Sometimes if you, you know, kind of open that window and people really wanna go to an assignment, they're like, hey, I'm just gonna do it even though my clearance isn't done. Please tell them, don't do it. It will not be good. All right, next slide. All right, I think I got six minutes left for questions, so I'm gonna hit this real quick. Um, we talked about, you know, how do you really engage with AFPC? One, get to know your MPF superintendent, know your FSS leadership. Please be in communication with your A1. If it is a complicated situation, we are always there to help. Um, please elevate those concerns to your command chief. I talk with your command chiefs every single day. I get emails from them every single day. Some of these situations you're gonna know don't fit necessarily nice and neat into an AFI or a reg, but you know it's gonna be the right thing to take care of your folks. Please elevate those concerns and we will work those as need be. Um, what I think a lot of times is portrayed is that AFPC doesn't necessarily care. AFPC sees what is a couple of lines written into CMS. So we don't always have the full picture. We don't always understand what is going on, but that's where we as chiefs fill in those gaps where we elevate that message and make sure that the full picture is being seen so that we can take care of your teams. The last thing I would say is, uh, people kind of laugh at this one, AFPC loves you and your airmen. We really do. Um, I work with some of the most compassionate, empathetic leaders ever, um, but like I said, we don't always see the full picture, but when you tell us the whole story, I promise, we are working diligently to take care of you and your airmen uh, sometimes us as chiefs just need to come together to help us see that full picture. So with that, we have five minutes. Um, please feel free to throw your spears.
Morning, Chief. Thanks for being here. Uh, Chief Sahai over at Dover. Uh, for the EFMP cell question, I'm trying to figure out ways that we can uh, work on better communication with them. Um, I'll give you an example of an airman that uh, submitted their package back in December, trying to uh, leave in March, uh, still waiting for any notification. When I've reached out uh, to talk to them, I kind of get the generic answer, hey, it's with the medical review process, have asked questions, okay, what's, what's the average? Because it's just for uh, one thing, I don't want to go into medical details, but it's something that's uh, fairly simple, members going to uh, Joint Base San Antonio. As we look there, um, I would like it, um, and being an EFMP member myself uh, from there, if as a chief or someone like that, that better? If as a chief or even our EFMP coordinators on base, if they could contact someone and actually talk to them instead of getting the generic email answer that takes about a week. So SimSAF has been trying to pin us down on a timeline, like how long can I tell airmen their process is gonna take once they submit? Um, ideally, if you don't have special needs, we should be able to work your case in two weeks. It should go through the process very quickly. We've designed a fast track um, so that you don't have to do some of the steps in there that are a little bit more time consuming. If you are EFMP, if you do have some medical needs, that process ideally is gonna be less than 45 days. We are absolutely nowhere close to that right now. Um, because of some of those issues with the IT, because of not necessarily having everything ironed out with the process, not having the right manning in different sections, right now our timelines are completely off track. This process was designed to be a first in, first out, so that if you as a member did your part, you submitted your package, you got in the queue, and then you moved through it. But what happened with those delays um, was we had this big bow wave that kind of built up. Um, we also had a lot of airmen that just weren't familiar with this. They didn't necessarily know what they needed to do, what they needed to submit. And so instead of being a first in, first out process, it became a prioritized by report no later than date. And so if you were the person who did your stuff on time, got everything submitted, you basically had people keep skipping over you because we had to get them cleared by their report no later than date to try and get them to where they needed to go. Um, in the next month or so, we need to be able to flip back to first in, first out, because that's how we're truly gonna be able to give you realistic timelines and say, once you submit your stuff, this is how long it should take, because th these are how long each of these steps are taking. Right now, we have less than a month's worth of data on really how long these cases are taking, um, and we're doing a lot of deep dive right now with our data analysis folks to try and get that right so that, no kidding, when you log into the system, you can see, hey, when it's at this step, this is how long it should take. Because now that you have visibility on it, you should have some expectations on how long you can expect. And if you see, like, hey, they said this step should only take seven days. It's now been sitting there for two and a half or three weeks. Let me engage and figure out what's going on with this because maybe something's gone wrong. Morning, Chief. Good morning. Hey, Sergeant Brazier from McGuire. Uh, first off, thank you to you and your team for the incredible lift that they do on a daily basis. It's just incomprehensible to my brain. Uh, my question has to do with Afor Gen, and uh, when I was introduced to it, the first thing that went through my mind was, you know, how, how is AFPC going to be able to um, manage that first quadrant? So my question is, is what are the big rocks that you and your team have identified? Um, and have, have we come up with a way to be able to, to manage that in order to make that F4 Gen model work? So I can tell you we are looking at it super hard. Um, there are some big rocks. Like you're, you're shifting all of these people into different groups. There are some that don't necessarily have the, the timeline to flip them that quickly. I don't know that it's gonna be super clean. The, the rollout or the, the switch to it, I, I imagine there's gonna be some bumps. There's gonna be some people that don't fit neatly into these new bins that we've determined. Um, I can definitely get you like a more in-depth um, dive from our team, but as far as me being able to tell you like, hey, these are the, the very specifics on it, um, I would need to go back and do a little bit more homework. But we, we know it's not gonna be super easy, but I promise we've spent a lot of time trying to work through some of those roadblocks that we know are gonna be there and figure out a more seamless way um, for it to roll out. Good morning, Chief. Good morning. This is uh, Sergeant Johnson from Nellis. Um, this is by no means to throw any spears. I just have a quick question. Um, what is the estimated date to clear the backlog of medical clearances? 
and what are what is AFPC doing to prevent the future backlog that's causing the last minute travel, which is causing uh, last minute assignments for our personnel, which is then causing other EFMP last minute you know, clearances for our members? Thank you. So right now we have about 100 cases that have March report no, late, no later than dates. Um, this week we pulled all of our medical professionals for, from throughout AFPC. So we have medical providers that work in our assignments team. We have some of them that do our MEBs, our ride loads, different things like that. We took every single medical professional that we have within our grasp and we said, get after these 100 cases for March and get after these 200 cases for April. That truly is our, our backlog right now. Um, as far as like big picture process changes, we are looking at hiring more contractors um, for the case builder portion of it, because we know that's been kind of one of those more time consuming portions of it. We have um, adjusted the beginning of the process. That's like the admin process, but that's where we injected some nurses and some PAs so that instead of saying every single person out there has to go through the same exact process, those that have less needs or don't necessarily need specialized care can move up to that fast track and that nurse at their level can make that recommendation to the gaining location so you don't have this bottleneck of people going through there. Um, so to answer like the original question, within 30 days we think the initial backlog should be cleared out, um, but we're going to continue to tweak different things in the process to really get after not necessarily creating another new backlog as we move into this next overseas cycle. Those two-part orders we think are going to be helpful um, really from the airman and family perspective so that even if you are waiting a little bit closer to your report no later than date to get the final clearance, at least you can take those administrative steps to get your TMO scheduled and get those needed documents for overseas. It's not going to necessarily fix every single issue, um, but we're, we're looking at all those different pieces to try and figure out how to not have it be so impactful where, no kidding, it's two weeks before you're supposed to move and you're just now finding out um, that you have orders to go ahead and do some of those tasks. All right, I'm, I'm going into A1 time, looking at my wingman over here. Okay. Are we good to keep taking a few more questions? Okay. Who's next? Ma'am, you want to go? Good morning, Senior Moore from Andrews Air Force Base. I had a question when you had mentioned earlier regarding like the rollout of my FSS and how sometimes we have to change vectors in order to be able to refocus on some of the other programs that we're trying to get after. And when you had brought up earlier in your example about that airman that was communicating how it did not go rolled out very effectively. What kind of mechanisms do you have in place now to try to address that? Because for example, when my FSS rolled out, we had months where, where it was not working effectively and women were, uh, airmen were having to re-vector their time to try to read, try to look into the system, talk to different issues because like fitness impacts a lot of other programs and things like that. So are we analyzing how that impact on airmen's time might actually not cause a cost benefit by refocusing those assets earlier and providing like an 80% product. So we receive a lot of feedback directly through the FSSs. You know, the, the FSSs really oversee all of those different programs for anything that's rolling out on my FSS. And we got a lot of instant feedback on my fitness and we, some of it we knew. Some of them were limb facts or discrepancies that we weren't necessarily tracking were going to be issues. Um, so as these new platforms continue to move out, please talk to your local FSSs because they're feeding us information where we go back and we work with the contractor to either get things fixed or at least provide that information um, that's hopefully making it down locally that, hey, we know this isn't perfect, but this is when this capability is going to be built out. We call them sprints. Like this is when this sprint is going to be completed where this capability and this capability is going to be available to the field. Anyone else? All right. Thank you guys so much. I will be around if you have additional questions. It's my honor to uh, be able to help you and your team, so please let us know what you need, and uh, we will stand by. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am.